Hi, this is Maggie Rose, and you're listening to Salute the Songbird on Osiris Media. I started this podcast to showcase women in music who inspire me and who I want folks everywhere to know about. My guests are icons in contemporary music, independent artists, studio musicians, hit songwriters, and power players behind the scenes. All of them challenging the status quo, respecting the hustle, and leading the way for women following in their footsteps. Salute the Songbird is a platform for women in music to share their stories and let their voices be heard. And everyone has a seat at the table. Welcome. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Salute the Songbird. And first of all, I want to thank everybody for all the love that they've been showing me for my latest release, Do It, that I just put out last Friday. Feels so good to put music out. And that, of course, is a single off a forthcoming record. It's called Have a Seat that I cut before the pandemic began in Muscle Shoals at Fame Studios with Ben Tanner of Alabama Shakes producing. So it's been very exciting after these strange times that we've been living in to finally be able to release music that I've been so anxious to share with you. So thank you for your support and thank you for tuning in to this week's episode. Today we're talking to Nikki Bloom and I actually had this conversation with her back in August. She and I had met at Marcus King's Four of a Kind virtual series that we were both performing in over the summer. She covered Coyote by Joni Mitchell the night that we recreated The Last Waltz by the band. And that song is not easy to do. And she was so impressive. And then I became obsessed and became a fan of hers. And she was very easy to talk to, incredibly vulnerable. We talked about divorce. We talked about her latest album, which is incredible, To Rise You Gotta Fall her experiences with the Gramblers, with Phil Lesh of Grateful Dead. And that week she was releasing a covers album of all share tunes, The Resemblance is Uncanny, and it was called The Beat Goes On. So make sure to check that out as well. Now I'm so excited to introduce you to my friend, Nikki Bloom. Nikki and I are neighbors, everybody, yet here I am in Alabama having this conversation with her remotely. We're just keeping with the times. I have so many questions about to rise, you have to fall. Birdie. We're both enjoying a little cocktail. My puppy just came (laughs) in and started shuffling around. Come here. Hi, Birdie. Let me lock my puppy outside. She's just like, she's not. Birdie. No. Hold on, Birdie. Okay. Nikki Bloom, welcome to Salute the Songbird. I salute you. You're a musician that I have known for quite some time, but it was because of Marcus King and our participation in his Four of the Kind virtual festival that he did back in July that I actually got to meet you in person. So welcome to the show and thank you for hanging out with me today. Thank you. Thank you so much. You did the most stellar rendition of Joni Mitchell's Coyote Mm. on the fourth night where we did the whole Last Waltz tribute. And you came strutting in in this beige suede head-to-toe outfit that was just, I want to borrow it. But it was also your command of what I would argue is the most complicated song to tackle of that whole evening of songs from that historical night of music. You were so convincing. I felt like you were channeling Joni Mitchell in every way. That's really relieving to hear you say that because when Marcus asked me to do that song, I was like, you know what? If there was ever a time, it's now because I have time to work on it and to like listen to it. Of course I know that song, but you don't really like know the details and the nuances and the phrasing. I didn't. And then I got in and it was like, this is so custom to her brain. And it was so cool to go in and be like, wow, to study her phrasing and her cadence. And um, I'm such a huge fan of Joni Mitchell. But because of those reasons that you said that it is a sort of challenging song, it would never really cross my mind to like indulge in learning it. So Marcus gave me such a great excuse to do it. And it was a perfect time to do it. And what an honor to show the stage with... All of those incredible musicians, including yourself, which that night you looked stunning. And thank you. I walked in and saw you, you know, um, singing BGVs. And then you walked up to the mic to sing lead. And I was like, hot damn, this girl. (laughs) And I loved it. I was like, yes, it was the same thing for me. He just got such 
fun, talented people there that night. And it was so fun to be exposed to each other. And it was kind of my first like venture out of my house. And so we were all very cautious and distanced and, you know, no hugging or really even handshaking or anything. And so it was so cool to like be excitedly close to people, but maintain the distance, you know? (laughs) Totally. That was my first foray back into live music and collaborating like yourself, Sierra Farrell, Devin Gilfillian. I mean, the, the list of people involved in that was so impressive. But then I think also to your point, the context being that we were in a complete live music drought. And then we were asked by someone who, you know, really knows their stuff. Marcus King is not someone that you want to disappoint. So when he asked you to do Coyote or Rick Danko, in my case, you don't want to mess that up. No. So he knows his shit and I wanted to deliver. And I think you certainly did. So one thing that you've done during this crazy year and this live music drought that I've really enjoyed was your visual album, The Beat Goes On, Nikki Bloom sings Cher. Uh, And I also love your performance. And I think that, of course, there's your likeness and image, but there's a deepness to share that you actually turned me on to because of seeing your performance and and what you did with her music. And I want to know how hard it was for you to get inside the head of an artist whom you respect deeply, but also why someone who's fully capable of writing their own original material would take on such a challenge. It, it happened pretty organically, to be to be perfectly honest. I was offered um, some tour dates in the Northeast, and there was one really big anchor date that was going to enable me to take a band on tour. And I was in between record cycles, so I was over one and hadn't quite written or recorded for the next record. Um, and... The turnaround on the music was going to be quick and I wanted to do something fresh and new. And I also got to a point where though the songs on to rise, you got to fall still resonate so deeply with me. They were so personal and raw, uh, the top topically that I was kind of ready to move on and perform something a little more jovial, at least for me, even though the songs that I chose from her catalog definitely explore the array of human emotions. Um, but it felt really good to get into somebody else's head. It felt really good to not have it be mine, to not have it be my words, to not have it be my pain or my sentiment, to be able to kind of be absorbed in somebody else's life other than my own felt really relieving. Totally. Um, and I really liked the idea of that. Um, it was recommended to me by a friend. We were sitting there talking about what, what's something fun and creative we could do. And she was just like, you should sing Cher songs. And I was like, it's so funny you say that because yeah. my entire life, Cher has been a thread in, in my life. I mean, since... I was seven years old standing at the grocery store and on the magazine rack next to the bubble gum, which is where I always looked, there was a magazine cover with what I thought was my mom's face on it because she looked at the time identical to my mom. And so in like my childlike Mm -hmm. brain, I couldn't really untease it and I couldn't really find the words to ask, mom, is that you? So I just sort of carried (laughs) that into my psyche And then, of course, so many movies ended up being my mom's favorite movies that Cher was in. And then, you know, mine. I love Mermaids. Moonstruck, Mask, Mermaids. I mean, it's like she's just, she's amazing. And I always kind of felt like she was this sort of distant aunt or godmother or something. I don't know. I can't really explain it, but. I can tell the connection is there. Visually stunning. Visually, the haircut, you know, the haircut and like the. Even, you know, some of the profile stuff, it's just like, yeah, I feel like she could be like my aunt or something. There's so many people that feel such a close kinship to Cher, but I think because she sort of had a more ethnic look and she, she's not Italian, but that resonated with me that like she had some background, you know, she had some Mm -hmm. like diversity in her blood, which I always found very comforting. You did her justice. The visual album is stunning. I really enjoyed the commentary in between songs. One thing that I thought was pretty cool about the commentary in between that makes me 
realize how resilient you are is that you spoke of on March 2nd, having a pretty dramatic surgery to remove a tumor from your uterus. And then there were complications involved in that surgery. And the following day, East Nashville, where you and I both live, was hit with that devastating tornado. Then the pandemic followed shortly after all of our shows were canceled overnight. So the fact that you've continued on with this goal that you had to put the show together and and sing these songs and and tour with that is really you know the irony is not lost on me that it's called the beat goes on and you kept the music going <laughs> and we keep our chops up and we pay deference to other artists and I don't know if you feel this way but during this pandemic it's almost exhausting or feels like I'm not reading the room when I feel too self-promotional about what I'm doing and what I have going on. So it's nice to mm. slip on a different artist perspective. I want to talk about your origin story just a little bit. I know that you're from Northern California. Yep. I grew up in a town called Lafayette, um, which is mm -hmm. just about 10 minutes east of Berkeley. Um, but I lived for uh, about a decade of my adult life in San Francisco, in Ocean Beach. And that's how you got connected with Phil Lesh and friends and the Terrapin Band. And how did that come to be? Yes, I think that that came to be, and it's hard to think back and really untangle it and go back to the, the purest source, but I think it was probably through Jackie Green, who... Um, is a dear friend and I met very early in my musical career and he started playing with Phil and I think, you know, Jackie would have shows at the Fillmore in San Francisco and I would come and sing and Phil would come and play. And I remember the first time I was on the same stage as Phil for the first time with Jackie. And I just remember being like, man, my brother is going to be so jealous that <laughs> I am standing on stage with Phil right now. And that was like, that was like the biggest excitement for me at that time was making my brother jealous. But I since just then not have, that you were on stage um, with Phil Lesh of Grateful Dead, but that your brother was going to be envious of you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I love it. Yeah, that's that kind of says something, I guess, about about me and my family dynamics. Um, hey, whatever <laughs> motivates you. Yeah. No, but but aside from that, it was obviously a, a, a huge honor and just having my brother play that music for himself, um, his whole life and, and us living together by osmosis, I just learned all the Grateful Dead catalogs. So it was, yes, making my brother jealous and then also like, wow, this is the guy who played all of those songs that my brother played right. for me. And <clears throat> the culture of the Grateful Dead, obviously, it's just like almost mystical you know, it is. And like the history and being in San Francisco and like being able to drive, you know, I would like drive and like take pictures of their stoop, you know, on Haight-Ashbury. Mm -hmm. I was mm -hmm. definitely, it wasn't just about making my brother jealous in truth. I've done it. Yeah. I mean, you feel, and the Jefferson Airplane, ha airplane house is there too in Seacliff and it's just stunning. I mean, San Francisco had such a what a culture, what a, what a movement. Um, it was really fun to live there and to spend so much time there and to get to play with the guys that made it all kind of go. It's a movement. Off. I mean, you have Sweetwater, you have the Terrapin, you have these venues that still embody what that whole, that whole vibe is about. And I think it goes hand in hand with you know, you moving to Nashville sonically, I feel like what people love in San Francisco is also revered, especially in our community of East Nashville. People are still devout deadheads and, and will be for a long time. But you've gotten to witness a fandom that for people who don't know anything about this, they don't understand that it's a lifestyle. So yes, what was it like to be on stage in front of an audience that, you know, it's almost like a religion when they follow mm -hmm. Grateful Dead and, and mm -hmm. there's Shakedown Street mm -hmm. and just all these, these things that if you know, you know, mm -hmm. what was it like? Did it ever even scare you at times to be written in, in this kind of history? 
What I'll say first and, and most, very most honestly, is that the Grateful Dead fans are so kind and loving. And that culture of like loving kindness is really what I found to be the foundation of that group of people, which Mm -hmm. is really cool because there's a lot of groups who kind of preach one thing and behave in another way. But the culture of, of the deadheads is very inviting and very kind. Um, of course you want to deliver what they want, right? Like you want, they, they know the, the catalog better than, you know, half the people on stage. Right. So, you know, I think that what you have to do when you enter into that world is to pay honor to it, but to also bring something that is you and and that is your own. And I've now played with, with both Bob Weir and Phil Ash and, and they're supportive of you being you Mm -hmm. doing the thing, doing their thing, uh, playing their songs, but they're very open-minded to allowing you to be the artist you are. I think Phil in particular is just such a supporter of ushering young artists and musicians and giving them a platform and a chance to like be heard and be seen. I mean, and his work ethic is just incredible. He opened Terrabin Crossroads. Um, and he worked, I swear, Maggie, I think he worked like 300 days the first Mm -hmm. four years that club was open. He played so much and, you know, I was inspired. I was like, man, if he can be on the road for however many decades he's been on the road and through it all. And he's can play, you know, all these shows like I better giddy up here because I'm young and I've got a long road to hoe. Yes, you do. So he was an inspiration just in, in work ethic. Yeah, He has been amazing to watch. I, I think inclusivity is so at the forefront of what they're all about. And I've seen pictures of you between Bob Weir and Phil Lesh and it's surreal, but you really seem to belong there. And when I listen to your music, I think you've, you probably already had that within you, but you follow through on that warmth and openness, I think. So the fact that you can fit in there and belong there, I think is a testament to your musicianship, but also just like your aura, you know, who, who you are. I mean, it is really fun. I will say it's like, you know, when you go and play those shows, you typically don't get the set list until the day of. (laughs) Yeah. It's like you're cramming for finals, you know, and then the show comes and you have all this pent up like energy and then the show happens and then it ends and you're like, was that good? I think it was good. But you're just like so relieved and you're just like, okay, we did it. Woo! I mean, it's like a whole thing. I read and heard somewhere, our buddy Andy Frasco, you guys had a conversation on his World Saving Podcast. And one of my favorite Mm -hmm. nuggets that I got from that was that you were not hell bent on pursuing a career in music initially. And there was a moment in time that made you realize that you wanted to be a musician. What was that? It was not like a light bulb moment where I was like, okay, I'm doing this. I'm going to do music. It was a little bit more organic than that. I mean, when the moment finally came, I guess it was making that final decision and and that final leap. I am a trained school teacher, so I can teach K through six. I got my credential and realized very quickly that teaching is the hardest thing ever. I was teaching at an autistic school and teachers ought to make what doctors do or lawyers because they are angels. It's the hardest work I've ever done. Um, And I went back to horses and I loved, loved working with horses. I was working out in Rancho Santa Fe and then that I had a locational move and I started substitute teaching again, which At that time, I had met my now ex-husband and we had made a first record together and he really mentored me and was like, if you want to do this, I will, let's make a record, but you have to tour it. You have to tour it. And I was so afraid. This was back in 2008. I was so afraid. I didn't know what that meant. I was like, what do you mean I have to tour? How do I do that? I mean, I had like no idea. So we made a record and I, that's when I got the band together. This was the Gramblers. And at the time I was still substitute teaching and it basically was like a slow shift where I was doing music and taking weekend gigs, playing shows. And it was like the substitute teaching calls would come in and 
the more that came in, the more I had to turn down because I was going to play music. And finally the balance kind of shifted to where it was like, I would get called for teaching jobs and I'd be like, nope, can't do it. I got the show. And, and that's when it kind of flipped. And then from that moment on, it really just continued. Um, you know, I was really lucky to have a very strong mentor. Um, and he, I'm not going to say he forced me to do it, but he really strongly encouraged me to pursue music. And he had been in it already for over a decade himself. And so he was able to kind of like guide me and tell me what I needed to do. And he was very lending in teaching me and, and ushering me into what it meant to, to try to be a musician full time. And I mean, we all have our catalysts, whether it be a person or an event that, that pushes you for good into a certain place. And I'm really glad that he did that. But I, I did see and hear and read a couple of situations in which you kind of plainly said he made me do it in, in a joking way. But your ex-husband, Tim Bloom, who's also a great musician and front man of Mother Hips. And it's nice that you had someone who was a mentor like that. But the language in which you said, like, he made me do it, I think is funny because it's such a natural seeming like a vocation to you because you're so honest in a way that's not contrived and it seems incredibly natural to you and your abilities but you had been part of the gramblers since 2008 and you'd been part of this big outfit you had i can't go for that your hollow notes cover that you guys did in the car just explode and go viral thank you john i know we love john have you met john oh yeah yeah john i mean he's john a Oates. huge part we're of talking like, about john Oates. yes hollow notes he's the best i mean um, and if you guys haven't seen this she's driving a car with the rest of her well some of her bandmates the gramblers and it it's got millions and millions of views and yet you were all very well known for your original material too but it's very impressive they're all playing these tiny instruments and you should go check it out tell me your story about john really quick yeah i mean honestly that we had been doing those van sessions which were really fun and it was a way for us to pass the time when we were on tour and we would just cover songs with little instruments and John saw that video and he really was the one to kind of like blow it up. And I think Twitter was very strong um, as, a, as a social tool at that point. Uh, Instagram did not, I don't think there was Instagram yet. And it really did change the course of our path. I mean, suddenly we were, you know, being invited to come out. I remember play, to play Birmingham. We had never even left California, you know, and it was like, they want us to come to Birmingham? It was like, it, it sort of opened up these doors of touring and touring further away from home. Um, and it was very cool. And years later, um, I, I've since been on the stage with John, um, I want to say at Merle Fest. He sang a song together. I'd have to get back to you on, on which one it was. But he's just been so nice to me. I saw him at Hardly Strictly Bluegrass. We were on a panel together, I think. I mean, he just kind of opened up all these opportunities um, because of the rendition that we did of his song. And he was so gracious and so kind. And it was just really kind of, like, amazing to to be palling around with such a legend. Yeah, he's he's the best. And tell me, what's you been your experience? Kind of intimidating to write songs with and all of that, but really, have you written with him? Oh, I've I've gotten to write with him, and he is so level-headed and easy to be around. He actually helped me do some doctoring on a song for an album that I have forthcoming. You know, he just did it because he is invested in what's going on with the up and coming acts in Nashville. And of course, he's one half of Hall and Oates, but he's also, I just feel like he's he's got his finger on the pulse of what's going on and and wants to be a part of it and, and did some pretty instrumental edit suggestions on a song that I have called What Are We Fighting For on this record that if he hadn't kind of shown me the way, it probably wouldn't have the impact that it does now. But um, that's very cool. I think it's yeah, he's great. And it's it's kind of hard to believe that you know, he's just lives in our town. He's he's willing to work and collaborate. I forget that he lives here because when I met him, he was still living in Colorado. 
It's like, we need to all go get coffee or something. And I think he still has a place in Colorado. Okay. Let's let's go to his place in Colorado. That's what I want him to do. Yes. Um, write a song. I want to write a song with you. Definitely. We'll just be like, For John, sure. we need a snow retreat. Let's all go to Colorado and just write and ski. <laughs> I'm I'm down for all of that. We'll bring Birdie. Yes. The Gramblers is a great band. I love the music that you guys put out together. I know what it's like to have that camaraderie and that alliance of a band with you. And then all of a sudden you, know, you feel substantiated by the people around you. And it's hard to reemerge when that outfit isn't there. So I can really appreciate your project with The Beat Goes On, especially after you gave us everything that you mm -hmm. got with mm -hmm. this record that you made with Matt Rossbang. First of all, I want to know how you got connected with Matt. And Matt is an incredible producer engineer. He's worked with artists like Jason Isbell and Margot Price, he, John Prine. He's engineered unreleased Elvis tracks. He got all of his training and tutelage at Sun Studios in Memphis. He's studied the Sam Phillips Bible. He's quite a gifted musician, engineer, producer. And this was shortly after your divorce with your ex-husband, whom I've never met. You moved to Nashville fearlessly, and then you got linked up with a great band. And the quote that I was going to paraphrase that I loved was in the trailer for to Rise You Gotta Fall, where you said that you wanted to work with Matt. You went to Memphis for the following reasons. To work with someone like Matt, to be in a place that's unfamiliar, mm -hmm. to make a record with people you didn't know. The only baggage you brought mm -hmm. was the words that you were singing. And it just, it kicked my ass when I heard that in your trailer, because I heard all of that in your album. And I felt... Like you were just stripping all of the armor that you had on, like everything that you had known, and you were making this record that was all Nikki and just you. And I'm sure that had to scare the shit out mm -hmm. of you, but it also was so worth mm -hmm. doing. Like so many questions in, in what I'm saying, but how? <laughs> Period. Yeah. The thing about it for me and what I distilled after a lot of thinking and confusion and pain and heartache, I was like, okay, to stay in what I'm in, to stay in this known world feels scarier than trying something new. So it really got to this point where it was like, it, it feels less scary to just go for something I don't know, because you know, when you know the dynamics of a group and, you know, I love the Gramblers and I always will. And I, you know, I'm so appreciative to Tim and what he taught me. Um, and the time he put in to, you know, helping me develop as an artist, it was huge, but you know, there comes a time when change needs to happen and change is always scary, but change is usually better. And, you know, growing pains don't just happen when you're, when you're a kid, they happen your whole life. And even though, you know, when you're a kid, it's physical, your bones are physically growing. But when you're an, an adult, your mind is growing and your person is growing and it hurts, you know, it just does. And you hurt people along the way too sometimes. And from that hurt, you learn and, you know, that's evolution, I think. Yeah. So, um, it was scary to go off on my own, but it was also like, Maggie, I was in like survival mode. I mean, I was in deep survival mode. I was like yeah. facing so much adversity and, um, life changes. And I just knew in my heart of hearts that having a clean slate at that period in my life was what I needed to do. I didn't want to go into the studio and have, you know, when you know people so well, you're like, oh, I know what they're going to say about this line or this song, or I can, I can, right, right. I can like, um, you know, predict, like, you know, people so well, a band that you've traveled with for a decade and you've recorded with, you just, you know what the dynamic's going to be. And you're just like, I don't want to do that. These songs are so personal. Like, I don't want anybody to know me 
because I just want them to like shape the song and I want them to give it the life that they think it deserves. And Matt did such a great job in taking the reins because Tim had produced all but one of my last records. And I really needed somebody um, who was going to take a strong seat in the production world. And Matt was just so great in picking the band who now feels like family. I mean, I love them. They're all so, so incredible. Tell me about the band. Um, Al Gamble played uh, keys. He's amazing. And I have to say the key work on this record is one of my favorite components of it it's i mean there's roads and whirly i think i heard like mellotron mm-hmm. on one yeah. you you have a way of being really classic and timeless but there's a contemporary element to it and a psychedelic element to your music sonically and then also like all the visuals you put out there it's like you're borrowing from all these chapters of your life and they're represented on that record so al gamble Yep, Rick Steff also played a lot of the keys, and he's just phenomenal. I mean, so sensitive, and he he has such a willingness to get inside the songs and really try to be where you are mentally and fit your mood. I mean, he's, he's a special person. And so he and Dave Smith, they've played on a ton of records together, one of which was Cat Power's The Greatest. And Ken Coomer, um, who was a longtime member of Uncle Tupelo, which then became Wilco, played drums, and he's just such a sensitive drummer. I mean, the stuff that he would do, I was like, oh my God, you're listening. He's like, girl, I'm listening to your lyrics. The title track, the drums on the title track and the snare, so tasty. I love the first line. You're like, just sitting on the porch, strumming and smoking some green. And And that's (laughs) exactly... We live in East Nashville. That's exactly... I actually wrote that song in Sausalito, (laughs) and it was kind of like the first happy song I'd been able to write in forever and it was like this little glimmer of hope you know you know when you're in a dark place and you're just like I'm never gonna write anything positive again this is just all gonna be me spewing my pain and then I wrote that song and it was like okay processing is happening things are looking up getting better yeah you know it was a it was it was a nice break in the clouds for sure um and then Matt not only did Matt produce the record but he played a bunch of acoustic guitar Will Sexton played Um, electric and Mm -hmm. yeah it was kind of a dream team for me honestly I was phenomenal band truly I love the there are a few tracks that I have to admit made me emotional the the last to know Mm. really got me Mm. it really I don't know if it was just what was going on at that point in time when I first heard it but it really stopped me in my tracks and then there was also you stopped loving me oh yeah there was like a bonnie ray element to that of like i can't make you love me to where you really showed me some vulnerability there i think that there's like a closeness that i feel with you having spent so much time with this album and i think that was the medicine that you needed but it also doesn't seem like um just a sad album about heartbreak at all. There's so much strength in it to me, especially knowing that you had deviated from everything you had ever known to record these songs and write them in in a scenario in which you were totally resting on your own morals and your own intuition. Yes. Um, but those two songs in particular really got me. I love the title track and the instrumentation of it as well. I've listened to it many, many times. But those two songs I have to ask you about what was the increment of time in between writing those and recording them and how hard was that to do? It sounds raw regardless if you had written it a year in advance, but it sounds almost like you had penned those a day or weeks before recording. Yeah, so, you know, divorce is a really long process. It takes a long time. Even if you know it's happening, even if you know that, you know, legally it's happening, it just, it's something that takes a lot of time to unpack, years, really. And so I started writing just as you would in your life. I started writing in my marriage as it was dissolving just because I would write about my life and that's always been my catharsis is to write. And the songs sort of started turning in that direction. And, you know, sometimes your songs like preempt even what you know to be conscious. Like you you sort of start writing subconsciously. I don't know if this ever happens to you where you're writing something and you don't even really actually know 
what it is um, until much later. And then you're like, wow, my intuition was actually correct. And I can sort of decode what I was even trying to say at the time. Like, how did, how do I love you? Which is the first track I think on that record. I love that song. Was mm -hmm. the first song that I wrote. That was sort of the beginning of my journey. Like still trying to figure it out. I was still in it. I was still like, how do I do this? How do I make this relationship work? And you know, the last to know, which is the song that you're asking about, which is the last track on the record, was one of the last songs that I wrote. And you know, at that point, I had had time to process. I had had therapy. I think that I had finally started to come out to Nashville and write and I remember I had a session a writing session in Nashville I was still living in San Francisco and that was a huge catalyst to get me to move here in the first place is that I would come here to write because I had lost a writing partner in Tim my ex-husband and I knew that I liked to work collaboratively with people you know I love to write on my own but I also really enjoy like the community and the dialogue and conversation and ideas that can happen from a writing session um, and I think that the very best writing sessions um, feel almost like a therapy session you know uh, so I wrote Last to Know the bulk of it and I was driving over to have a write with Simon Gugela, who is an amazing songwriter here in Nashville. And I had the idea of, you know, why was I the last to know? And I showed up to his house and I told him that that was the line that I wanted to write around. And he was like, well, tell me more about that. And we just started talking about my story and we started talking about my experience and we started talking about our experiences. And it was just a really illuminating conversation and when I left, it felt like I had such a huge weight lifted off my shoulders. It was like a, it was like a final closure. It was like, okay, I've processed. I have wrapped my brain around this. I'm okay with this. It was sort of a surrender. It, it really is a song of surrender. So the first song is sort of like this desperation to like figure it out and hold on. And then the last song is like letting go, surrender. So... You know, writing over two years of the dissolve of a marriage, you get the full spectrum of, you know, what it is to go through a divorce. It's my experience. And I hope I never have to write a record like that again, honestly. The fact that you found catharsis through writing and sharing in that experience is, it's wonderful. It's a gift to me to be able to hear that and process through it. Because even not going through a divorce, the lyrics were so applicable to me in so many other ways. So you don't really know what you're doing and how that's shaping the music that you're writing is going to affect people in a myriad of ways. And I heard so certain songs and I was able to apply it to my relationship with the industry yeah. or yeah. my relationship with my own self yeah. at times and, and patience, um, which you have because you're a teacher. <laughs> but you also have because you're a musician. I don't have it. I have to ask for it. I remember that was like one of the things I was trying to manifest most. And I would like pray to whoever it is I pray to, like, please just give me patience. And I sort of in my mind thought it would just suddenly be bestowed upon me until I realized what happens is you just sure. keep getting doled out. Like, you know, here's the challenge. Show us that you can practice patience. And it's like, oh shit, I have to work for this. I have to like really right. practice patience, but it's certainly not easy. You know, communication is everything. And we have this existential crisis of being in the music industry where things are very um, fragile, they're fleeting. And I think you just have to find that joy that you have within yourself. And I heard that, I heard you as an individual really coming through. Just to wrap up this little section, I realized after a slew of unhealthy romantic relationships, post-divorce, you know, marriage included, I was just like, you know what? I really only have like room for one abusive relationship in my life. And that is the music industry. Like you got to have safe, safe romantic relationships, safe friendships, safe family relationships, because when you're in the music industry, like we are, that's abuse enough, you know? Yes, it is. Brutal. And they're so fickle. Ugh. And that's why we are grown ass women who aren't going to tolerate anything else because the mental health aspect of it is also 
something that can become overwhelming and a task. And you and I are both wearing our Neil Casal shirts mm -hmm. and pins today. And I know that he played with you with a lot of the stuff that you did with Phil Lesh and Grateful Dead. And I think this year has been extremely trying on musicians in particular who are realizing that their way of life is hindered, but you being out here and being vulnerable and honest and, and talking and connecting with me doing this podcast and giving me your time is what we have to do. We have to be over communicative and we have to let each other know that we're here. What is something that you're doing every day in addition to asking for patience to fortify your mental health and, and your artistry? The tools that I use are kind of endless. Um, I definitely am a huge advocate of therapy and I have a great therapist here in Nashville. And it was funny. I went to a session with her once and I said, well, I figured it was either I had to get on anti-anxiety medicine or get a puppy. So I got a puppy <laughs> and she was like, so Birdie I think that's arrived. a good choice. Birdie arrives. Enter Birdie. Yes. My my darling little Australian cattle dog who is making me go on walks and she's making me laugh and she is just such a light of life and also she drives me crazy and she makes me mad and it's all the it's all the good things of having a puppy you know she's digging holes and I get mad at her and then of course she's about as cute as they come and so I don't stay mad very long but you know I think that technology and the phone is such a double-edged sword because you know you can get so easily sucked in and you can start doing like you know, the comparison game and the shame game and all that kind of stuff, or you can find really helpful tools on, on the phone, which, you know, the Calm app you and I were talking about. Mm -hmm. I fall asleep to bedtime stories. I love the bedtime stories. To me, it's just like get in bed and have somebody read you a story. It feels really good. And there's so I, many. I like the Matthew, one by McConaughey. Matthew McConaughey. Oh, yes. <laughs> Jinx, where he's like, I was talking with Carl Sagan the other day. Oh yeah. And you're yeah. like, okay. Yeah. You know that he's just ripped like a huge joint right before he tells the story <laughs> about. He's got like a nice brandy in hand. Oh, yeah. He's driving his Lincoln. Uh -huh. It was the rattle of an antique telescope. Yeah. It's yes. So good. It's so Gosh, good. I could snooze right now. Puppies are good. Mental health is good. Reaching out to each other yes. is the best nature um huge yeah i encourage everybody to watch nikki's new visual album the beat goes on nikki bloom sings share it will make you so happy it's like a dreamy fever acid dream <laughs> with some of your favorite share songs uh who directed this visual album by the way so all of it was done by Jesse Noah Wilson, who um, is an amazing musician, producer, engineer. Um, and he, I could not have done this without him. I mean, he helped me have the vision. He was supposed to come out and be a band member on the tour. And we were just spitballing like ideas. And I was super bummed that the tour wasn't happening. And he was like, why don't we just do like a visual album? You know, we can all record remotely. I'll put it together. We can tell the story of like you, your, what your experience has been um, and how you've kind of survived this. And it tied in so well with Cher too, because it's like, I think there's a quote somewhere. It's like the earth might end and everything will die except for cockroaches and Cher. It's like, <laughs> she is such an extreme survivor, mm -hmm. you know? And I just take so much learning and lessons from her approach to like, surviving and reinventing herself and the strength that she has and the strength that she had to say goodbye to Sunny and to, I mean, just, just all the chapters of her life. Um, I don't know. She just seems like such a incredible force of nature. It was really fun to do. It was a really fun project to dive into. And I, you know, I love her movies. Um, and of course I was familiar with her musical catalog, but it was really fun to like dive deeper in and, um, pick out the songs that I wanted to do and just see like how many of those that Sonny Bono wrote. He wrote 
so many I know. incredible songs. He was very, very gifted as a songwriter. Incredible. Yeah. And I mean, no better mustache. Maybe, you know, Tom Selleck, but. <laughs> right. It, it's a rival. It's a, that's an intense rivalry. I want to finish our conversation by asking you, because this show is a show that caters to all female guests that I have. I think all too often we talk about the plight of being a woman in the industry might be, but I personally think there are many advantages as well from either a creative perspective or a business perspective. And I want to know what you think an advantage you have um, might be with your unique perspective? I think it's taken me about a decade to be able to say that I've had enough experiences now, good and bad, where my intuition has become sharpened. There's a lot of people in the industry who will take advantage of you. Mm -hmm. And I've had to kind of live that and experience that. And it sounds like you've done the same. Sure. And while, you know, you can lament on the pain of that and being burned and gaslit and all the terrible things that can happen, it also does help you to have a discernment and it helps you sharpen and trust yourself, you know, um, and, as painful as, as it is in real time, you start to kind of learn, like, I can see where this could lead me. I can see trends in this kind of behavior. It helps give me a, a, a compass on how to navigate, you know, having a slew of experiences. Which you certainly have. Yeah, I certainly have. You know, I, I don't think you could really escape a life in the music industry without, without that. You know, and if you do, you're incredibly lucky. Nikki, you're the best. Thank you for having me, Maggie. You're such a delight to talk to. You're a delight. This is awesome. Cheers. I'll see you back in East Nashville, okay? Okay. All right. Cheers. Take care. You too. Bye. Mwah. Bye. And that's a wrap. I just absolutely adore her. I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. And make sure to keep up with Nikki on her socials at Nikki Bloom. And that's B-L-U-H-M. And to keep up with me, my music, and my touring calendar, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at I am Maggie Rose. Make sure to check out my latest release, Do It, that just came out on February 19th. And you can find me on Patreon at patreon.com slash I am Maggie Rose, where you can get exclusive Salute the Songbird content, along with new music, live stream concerts, and more. You've been listening to Salute the Songbird on Osiris Media. The executive producers are Kirsten Cluthy and Brad Stratton from Osiris Media and Austin Marshall. And the show is edited and mixed by Brad Stratton. Original music by Maggie Rose. Please subscribe to Salute the Songbird on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast content. And if you like the show, please recommend it to a friend or leave us a review so that others can join the conversation. Thanks for listening, and to close out the show, here's the title track from Nikki's latest record, To Rise You Gotta Fall.
Your story longer. She said. 